So welcome everyone to the second of three conversations with notable scientists here at Berkeley Lab. My name is Jeff Miller, I'm Head of Public Affairs and your host for today. My guest's name is Kathy Yellick, she's the Associate Lab Director of Computing Sciences. Please give her a very warm welcome. What is supercomputing and what is its value to society? You know, supercomputing is um, a, you know, a term that we use to talk about um, the biggest computers, or really it's the fastest computers, how, regardless of how large they are. So the, pro the computers that are used to solve some of the biggest computational challenges um, in the world. And those are used for things like um, basic science problems, understanding um, the universe, understanding the world around us, uh, climate change, uh, for developing new materials, new chemi chemicals, um, and new solutions to various uh, problems in the world. So it seems that there are teams of specialists here that have to be involved in this type of work, correct? You know, one of the I interesting things about this, this area, which we call computational science, so it is pl applying computers to science, is that it's highly interdisciplinary. And so we are using computers to understand physics, to understand chemistry, to understand biology, um, understand various uh, engineering problems and energy and other things. You need to have an expert in the science. You need to have an expert in the computers. Um, often, especially today, with these supercomputers can be very complicated to program. You need to understand something about how to map those um, programs onto those supercomputers. And you often need, in the middle of it, all a, a mathematician who uh, really understands the equations and how to translate them. So you, you have these interdisciplinary teams that have to work together. And it is both one of the most, uh, I think, challenging things about computational science and one of the very exciting things about it. So do they understand, or other folks, for, uh, for that matter, who you come in contact with, will they understand uh, the role of a national lab in this process? So you mentioned NERSC, and that's a user facility, and we should talk a little bit about that, about how it's public and accessible to, to scientists from around the world. Um, so we can start there, but, but also in, in thinking about this, the a national lab uh, assemblies of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary teams of scientists looking to solve big problems. Is that something that's really distinctive about national labs? What about this one in particular? You know, I think that um, Berkeley Lab is, is really unique in offering both access to um, unique uh, facilities of various types of facilities, including the supercomputing facilities. So these are kinds of supercomputers that cost tens of millions of dollars. It's not the kind of thing that you, um, you know, even a, a university will typically go out and buy. And, um, and there are, there, and also the expertise. So there's all this expertise within the lab about how to design algorithms for these supercomputers, how to, uh, how to program them, and how to um, develop the applications for all of these um, exciting disciplines. And so I think that the, the labs um, in general play a unique role within the research landscape in that they, they really offer um, these, these unique facilities for uh, some of these big science problems. So science problems that an individual scientist um, can't do at home and, or you know, in their own lab with their own lab notebook or just their own you know, personal computer. It's really, um, there are some problems, and not all science problems, but there are certainly some problems that require big facilities in order to um, in, in order to, to address that science problem and facilities like NERSC are an example of that here at Berkeley Lab. So let's spend just a little bit of time talking about some probing a little deeper in some of these examples with huge societal impact. So climate modeling visualizations would be one example and then we let's talk about human health as well but let's start with the climate again. Well, you know, if you look at something like climate change, um, it's a there's it's very complicated set of physical phenomena that you're trying to capture, and so you're building a model to try to explain what happens if we, um, you know, if we decrease the amount of carbon that is being produced every year. What will happen to the climate? Will the oceans, um, you know, will the ocean still rise? Will the level still rise? Will um, you know, will the um, ice sheets melt? I mean, there, there are a number of questions that you can and do answer um, using, using these, uh, these computer models and simulations of 
think some, something like climate change. Um, we're also developing things like solutions, uh, you know, understanding the, the combustion process, which is used in so many of our, uh, you know, transportation and in, in big power plants and things like that, um, and trying to optimize the, the kinds of devices that we, we build to make them more energy efficient and, uh, and produce less, less emissions. And so those are the kinds of things that you can do with, with computer systems. And both of those are examples of some of the biggest simulations. They have large um, interdisciplinary teams of people that um, develop the codes and, uh, and run them on the, and sometimes it's different people who run the codes from the ones who are analyzing the data. So there's large teams involved in these projects. So big challenges uh, facing supercomputing. And is there, uh, am I reading this correctly, there's a race, a supercomputing race to have the largest and fastest computer? Is that really going on and should we really care about that? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, what I really care about is um, how well we can continue to design computers that are better and faster and more effective for solving real science problems. And, you know, there are ways that we measure the speed of these computers and so we can get into some competitions about, about that. But what's really important is, um, you know, if you look at uh, something like an iPhone. So an iPhone 20 years ago would have been uh, the, the supercomputer at NERSC was a Cray YMP. That is the capability of what's in your iPhone. How many years ago was that? Just About 20, 20 years, years, 20 years okay. ago. Yeah. So, um, you know, that would have been a one ton, $10 million plus supercomputer, uh, you know, not, not your iPhone. Um, and so it, it and, and that, that kind of scaling has uh, certainly affected supercomputers and, um, but they affect computers all through all different scales. And what I'm very concerned about right now is um, that we're seeing real problems in the technology going forward. That is, can we make supercomputers any faster? And it's always hard to know, or computers in general any faster. It's hard to know what we'll get out of that in terms of either scientific instruments or in terms of personal um, devices. But you know, we, we would not have Google or iPhones if we hadn't made computers faster. So with that, we've reached the end of the program. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Thank you, audience. Please. Ex please.